verses 1 through 6. And before we read, many of you have asked if we're the ones that adopted the little girl and now we're adopting a little boy. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. We're in the process of adopting a, a fourth child. Amanda is seated right over here. Amanda, wave your hand. This is Amanda. She is from Peru. We adopted her two years ago. I saw Amanda for the first time when I was three, told my wife about her, or when she was three, told my wife about her. Later we went to Peru when she was four, and we started praying about it, and God allowed for us to adopt her, and we brought her home. Now we're working on a little boy from China. Our oldest children, our, our natural children, Deborah and Eric, some of you have met met Deborah. She was here two months ago. She visited here and stayed with Andy and Uncle Bruce. Our second child is Eric. Amanda is our third and our fourth will be David. Last week, U.S. Immigration approved the paperwork that allows us to bring a child into the country, but there's a lot of steps still to go. We have sent all of our paperwork. First, I had to take it all and drive it to Tallahassee and get everything um, authenticated. And then I had to go get the great uh, seal of the state of Florida on it. And now that's on its way to the Chinese consulate. And then it should be back in a week or two. And then all our paperwork goes to China. Then China has a process that takes about three months that they're going to go through. And uh, Lord willing, next spring, somewhere around March, we should be going to China. We're really excited about that. We're going to go see the Great Wall of China that's so well known. Um, our little boy, David, is six years old. And this will be his sign name, David. Amanda um, is down here on your cheek, and then David up on the forehead. Next year, we should be getting him. We're very excited about bringing him home. It's such a blessing. We can't wait to get him. John chapter 14 and verses 1 through 6 say, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whether I go, ye know, and the way ye know. And Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how shall we know the way? In verse 6, And Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you in prayer, and we're grateful for your blessings on this deaf church. Lord, for Bruce and Vicki as they've served here, at Deaf Baptist Church. Lord, I pray that you'll help them continue to be a light into the community around them. Lord, I pray that Deaf will be saved and grow in the Lord here and be strengthened for you. Lord, bless our time as we read your word together. Bless my signs that they'll be clear, that my wife will voice clearly, that together we'll share your message and we'll understand and read the, as we read the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. When we open with this first verse, he tells us, let not your heart be troubled. We say, well, why is he saying that? If we go back up to verse 13, Jesus has just told the disciples that are sitting there, he's there with the twelve, one of you will betray me. And I am going to die. I'm going to be killed. And this was not news that the disciples wanted to hear. 
Imagine if my friend walked up to me and said, you know what, next week one of your family members is going to die. I wouldn't like to hear news like that. I wouldn't want to believe that. That would be tragic news. But Jesus has just told the disciples that very day, one of you will betray me, and I'm going to die on the cross. They didn't know what to say. They didn't want that to happen. Jesus was healing people and preaching and feeding the multitudes. And all of a sudden, the pictures changed, and he's going to die. And he said, as a, as a prophecy has been written, I am going to die. Boy, that was distressing news to the disciples. Death is a sad thing. Nobody likes death. It's a terrible thing. In my church, we have two kids that have both been diagnosed with brain tumors. One is a little boy who is now seven and a little girl who is now eight. They're from different families. The little boy had a brain tumor that was diagnosed in November. They took him to the hospital. They did surgery. They tried to remove the tumor, but the tumor had engulfed the brain stem and penetrated it, and they were not able to remove all of the tumor. They done chemotherapy and radiation with this little boy. The other one is a little girl named Caroline. Her grandma's an interpreter in our deaf ministry. We know the family well. The little girl also was diagnosed with a brain tumor. It was not into the brain stem, and they were able to remove that tumor, and now they're doing chemotherapy and radiation with her. She was diagnosed in February, the other one in November. Last week, the little boy, whose name is Steven, came to the point where doctors can't do anything more for him. He's going to die. He has only a couple weeks to live. The little girl who is eight has been making progress. They've done the chemotherapy. Things look good. Her, her uh, prognosis is getting better and better. The little boy is going to die. It's a sad thing that a little boy is going to die. Last night, my friend in Jacksonville sent me a text message and said, do you know this person? And I said, yes. And he said, they have cancer. Did you know they have cancer? And I said, yes. And they're stage one, two, three, and four of cancer. And the doctor said, stage four. She's only got a couple months to live. Death is a sad thing. This is a nice lady, a Christian woman. But the cancer has spread too far. She's going to die. Jesus has just told the disciples, I need to tell you something. One of you will betray me, and I'm going to be killed. I'm going to die. And the disciples don't want to hear it. And he tells them next, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus was offering them peace. He said, don't worry. I'm here. You have me. If you believe in God, believe also in me. Are you worried? Are you discouraged? Don't let your heart be troubled. Today, I will tell you, maybe some of you have kids in school. Maybe some of you are older. Maybe you're a senior citizen. Maybe, maybe life is changing right now and things are not going well and maybe you've got financial problems or some other difficulty. Life is hard. Maybe you've got peer pressure at the school where you attend. I remember when I was in middle school and high school, I was not the biggest guy in the school. I wasn't. I was a skinny guy. People picked on me. They said if I turned sideways, I looked like a pencil. I was so thin in school. They made fun of me. I went to a mainstream school. I was the only deaf child besides my sister. She was great above me. Sometimes we would see each other, but mostly in the class, I'd be there. There would be hearing kids that would say, Hi, read my lips. And then they'd stick out their tongue at me. People made fun of me all the time. Kids were mean. There were 
were some deaf friends and I was oral, they made fun of me because I was oral. Kids are like that. Kids are mean that way. Thank the Lord I got saved when I was 13. I started going to church and I found out that if you have Jesus with you, it doesn't matter if people are mean to you. You can set that aside. You can have peace. And I learned how to stand in Christ. Sometimes people would say things that hurt my feelings. Then I went to college. And if you think you get, it got any better there, it didn't. Because I was a Christian. And I went to a secular college. I went to NTID and RIT. That's where you're going this fall. When I got there, I went into their summer program, and I was a Christian, and excited about serving the Lord. My sister had already gone, and I already knew where I could go to church, but I was going to live in the dorms, and that wasn't funny at all. I didn't know who my roommates were going to be. I prayed that I'd get Christian roommates. When I got to college, uh, my roommate hadn't arrived yet. Well, I went and looked at the campus and everything, and that night, I came back to the room, and there was a guy hauling <laughs> weights in my room. Now I described, when I graduated high school, I weighed about 105 pounds. I was a senior, 105, skinny as a rail. Uh, I got plenty, I made up for that since, but, but I was a skinny guy. And this big hunk of a guy was my roommate. And I said, hi, my name's John, and he cursed me out. Now, I didn't sign so well either. I was still mostly oral. Well, I learned my curse words that day because he gave me about 75 of them. I felt like I needed to go wash my eyes after he got done. I had never seen anything like it. I thought, what did I get myself into? He was so mad. He said, I signed the paper. I told my best friend was going to be my roommate. We grew up together. We've done everything together. And I told him, I want you to be my roommate. And I said, well, we can ask for a switch. I don't care. But we went down to the RA, and we told him that we don't want to be roommates. We wanted to trade. And he said, no, it's only a month. It's just summer. It's no big deal. In the fall, you can move where you want to, but just stay where you're at for the summer. He cursed out that woman. And he looked at me. And I said, what, what am I supposed to do? I scared to death of the guy. We went back to my room. That evening, they introduced everybody. Went around the room introducing him. My roommate looked at me, and he said, I saw you had a Bible on there. Are you a Christian? And I said, yeah. Oh, then he was really mad. You idiot. If you preach anything at me, I'm going to punch you right in the nose. It scares me to death. You know, I didn't have any martial arts skills or anything to rely on. He gave me one knockout punch and I get killed. I didn't say anything. I left the room and I said, Lord, I just don't know what to do. We went to that meeting. We're all sitting around the RA introducing everybody and welcoming everybody and telling them what we're going to do over the next few days. And then goes around the room. Everybody introduced. I said, hi, my name is John Olson, and I'm from Orlando, Florida. And my sign name is John. Nice to meet you. That's all I said. All I said, right? Nothing wrong with that. My new roommate gets up and curses me out and says, he's a Christian, and preaches their own person at me. I was just trying to be a nice guy. And there I said, oh, stop it, stop it, stop it. What about respect? You have to respect one another. You have to learn. He said, you didn't do anything wrong. I'm like, wow, I got a whole fleet of enemies. I was ready to pack it up and go home. I was scared to death. <laughs> I hadn't witnessed anybody. I hadn't even said the name Jesus. He saw my Bible, and that's how he handled it. I didn't know what I was going to do. It was rough. My sister didn't seem to have any problems. She went to college. She's real <laughs> quiet and shy. I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. But they were all against me. And I knew that there would be a lifestyle of sin at TID and RID, but I didn't 
expected to be the first day like that. So the next day I got home and my roommate said, do you drink? And I said, no. He said, I'm going to store, I'm going to bring some beer to the room. I said, no, you're not allowed to. He said, are you going to tell? I said, yeah. He said, you cry, baby. He said, I'm bringing my friends over for a party. I said, the RA said, no party for the whole month. After the month is over, the summer program, you, can par you can't party. When it's over, you can't. And if you bring them in here, I'm going to be in trouble too. He said, will you cry, baby? You're going to tell tale or what? And he said, don't do it. So he got mad and he went to find friends. I was scared. I was trying to think about what I would do if Jesus is with me. Jesus is with me. How am I going to resolve this? So I don't I understand how you feel, but it's only a month. You know, we should be able to manage this for a month. He got mad again. He wouldn't let me explain anything. He just started yelling at me. Boy, was he proficient in ASL. I didn't have to say two words before he started in on me. He didn't think anything of me at all. We got to Tuesday, and I went to classes all day, and when I came back to my room, I opened the door, and there was a sign on the floor, paper. And all his stuff was gone. He said, I am fed up. I can't stand living with you. You've messed me up. I had to withdraw and go home. Did I say anything to the guy? I didn't say a word to the guy. We hadn't had one discussion. Anything I started to say, he just got mad and went off on me. So took the note to the RA. And the RA said, no, you have to go get paperwork signed. You can't just withdraw. It's going to cost him $150. He took his room key. And I said, all right. Well, I went back to the room. Everything was gone. Everything was gone. He took it all. He didn't even tell me he was leaving. I said, I didn't have anything to do with it. I said, I tried. He said, I know, I know. So the RA left. Later that night, the RA came back and said, yep, he's gone. We called his parents. Um, you get a room to yourself for the rest of the month. <laughs> great, great. I had my own room. All the dorms had everybody paired up. And I was the only guy that had a room to himself. Quite happy for it. You know, sometimes we just need to not worry and trust God, and, and He'll give us peace. You know, that caused panic in my heart. I'm thinking, Lord, what am I going to do? You've got to help me here. I didn't have an answer for everything. And I thought, how did I get in a mess like this? But I knew God had led me there. I knew God wanted to be at college at NTID. But I was off to a bad start. When he left, I just said, Lord, thank you for helping me. We got through the month, and then I went to NCID for three years, and I graduated. I, I met so many deaf people there, learned how to witness, had the opportunity to see people say, God gave me this peace. I don't know what you're facing this morning. You guys probably didn't all go to NCID. This family that has a little boy that's seven, He's going to die. There's nothing funny about that. This is hard. What do we tell them? The parents are Christians. They wrote on Facebook, pray for Stephen. They said, this is very hard for us, but we trust Jesus to give us grace and peace as we go through this. We don't understand it. We don't know why this had to happen. It's beyond anything we've ever experienced. It is extraordinarily difficult. But pray for us and help us to accept whatever time we have left. You know what they did? They said, we're going to look to Jesus. If I were there with them, what could I say? The situation is so hard. God makes no mistakes. But how do you explain these things? Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Just look to Jesus. He has a plan. He's in charge of everything. He knows more about Stephen than his family knows. He knows everything about that little boy. He knows how many hairs are on his head. And he loves that little boy. 
The family has to just keep turning their eyes to Jesus, keep trusting in him. Maybe you've got a situation at school. Maybe you've got a situated, situation at church, some kind of problem at home. And you've been relying on yourself. Just turn it over to Jesus. He'll give you real peace. He said, well, I'm not happy. I'm discouraged. You know what? Drugs aren't going to give you any peace of mind. It's going to make things worse than they are already. Don't do drugs. Turn to Jesus. He'll give you peace. Let's look a little further in the scripture. He says, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. First, Jesus gives you peace. Secondly, he gives you a place. Jesus said, I'm going to go, and I'm going to make a place ready for you, a house for you. Isn't that great? In America, we've got a lot of problems with homelessness. How do we solve it? Well, suppose we say, let's take all the homeless people and bring them to our houses. Do, do we have room for them all? No. There are so many homeless people. Our church has a rescue mission and a women and children shelter for families that don't have any place to go, but it's only temporary. They can't live there permanently. We can help them for a while. We can give them suggestions to help them get on their feet, but then they have to go. It's very frustrating. The earth is temporary. Jesus said to the disciples, I had everything. That, or Jesus said to the disciples who had homes, who had jobs, who had everything, he asked them to leave those things. They had a place. Jesus said, give it all love and come follow me. And then he tells them, I'm going to die. And they say, wait, wait, we used to have a life. We have things. How are we going to get back our lives? And Jesus said, no, don't worry. I have a place for you. It's heaven. I have a place that's better. And then so you can have a home, and it might be nice, but it's not permanent. And it's going to deteriorate. Everything deteriorates on earth. God is going to give you a place. And you know what that place is going to cost you? Nothing. It's free. There's no mortgage. Some of you are paying a mortgage and you're paying utilities. You're not going to have that in heaven. He has a place. It's free for us. He promised to give us his peace and he promised to give us a place. That's tremendous. But that's not all he promised. There's another one. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Jesus gives you a promise. He gives you peace, he gives you a place, and he gives you a promise. He says, I'm leaving, and they're saying, no, don't go, don't leave us. He says, I'm going to promise you that I will come back. I promise you, I'm going to go, but I promise to come back and take you with me to heaven. I can just imagine. You know how kids, um, sometimes a parent will be dropping them off. Dad says, i got to go to work. And the kids wrap around the father's leg. And he's saying, i got to go to work. And the kids say, no, Daddy, don't leave. And they're trying, carrying on. In Jacksonville, we've got a lot of military. Some of those men leave six months to a year. And it's hard when you see the little children that don't want their dad to go. He's going to be gone. And he'll tell them, I'll be back in six months. I'll come back. I'll come back. And they're holding on for dear life. He said, you've got to let go. I'm going to come back. And with tearful eyes, they say goodbye as their dad goes. I love that TV program um, where, they, where they do the surprise, uh, the surprises for the military fathers come back home. They walk in and they'll call mother and daughter to the middle of a platform or something and they're all up there and they'll say, well, their dad has been in, in Iraq or somewhere for a long time and, and um, he's behind them on the stage and he's home early. They don't know he's coming and they turn around and they 
they go running, the kids go running, daddy, 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 and everybody's trying to pull out. I like to watch that. When somebody homecomes, everybody's excited about homecoming. Sometimes there's a kid that graduated and he wishes his dad could be at his graduation ceremony, but dad can't be there. And they're bringing in the graduates and the principals about to hand out the diplomas and then the father walks in with the diploma and the kid hugs his dad and he's graduating his dad's there to see him graduate from high school. And it's exciting because his father came home and they missed him. Someday, Jesus said, I'm going away, but someday I'm going to be coming back to get you and coming back to you. We have to let him know. It actually went, and the disciples saw him go, and they said goodbye. And the angel said, why stand ye here gazing? The same Jesus will come in like manner. He promised he's coming back. Jesus is going to come again for you and for me. He's going to take us to heaven. And then lastly, first we have peace. Secondly, we have a place. Thirdly, we have a promise. And then lastly, I'm so glad Thomas asked this question. Thomas said, Lord, we know not whether thou goest. And how can we know the way? Thomas said, you're going to heaven, but how do you go there? Where's the map? Where's the GPS that gets you to heaven? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The disciples said, but when you go to heaven, how are we going to get there? And Jesus said, you need to get baptized. You need to go to church. You need to give money to the church. You need to get good grades in school. No, he didn't say those things, did he? What did Jesus say? He said, turn to me. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the light. And if you come with me, you'll get to heaven. All you need is me. We find a path. He gave us a path to heaven. Jesus said, I'm the path. Maybe this morning you don't know where you're going to go when you die. Some of you will die sooner. Some of you will die later. But when you die, will you go to heaven? You might say, yes, yes. How do you know? Well, I was good. I've been a good employee. I think positive. I'm religious. None of those things will get you to heaven. You say, well, um, I believe in God. And I read my Bible and I pray every day and I take communion or I go to Mass and I light a candle and I pray. None of those things will get you to heaven. Religion won't get you to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way. You get there through me. It's through me. There is no other way. There's no idol that can get you to heaven. They will land you in hell. How do you get to heaven? Through Jesus Christ. Jesus was born, grew up on this earth, lived a perfect life, and then went and died on the cross. He was crucified for you and I, for our sins. He was buried, and three days later, he rose again, alive forevermore. If I want to go to heaven, I have to ask Jesus to forgive my sins and save me. And he will. And when I die, I'll go to heaven. If you want to go to heaven, how are you going to get there? Through Jesus Christ. So I'm just not so sure about all that. That's your philosophy. Mine is different. You can't get to heaven, Jesus said. The Son of God said to us, if you want to go to heaven, you've got to do it through me. Through Jesus Christ, you can go to heaven. If this morning you've been sprinkled, that won't get you to heaven. If you've been baptized, that won't get you to heaven. If you're Lutheran, that won't get you to heaven. Coming to Death Baptist Church won't get you to heaven. You have to personally, individually, ask Jesus to come into your heart and forgive you and save you. And when you do that, he will save you. God,
pave you a way to get to heaven through Jesus Christ. If this morning you've never received him, you should raise your hand during the invitation and say, Bruce, I don't know if I'm going to heaven. We'll take the Bible this morning and show you how you can go to heaven through Jesus Christ. Isn't that tremendous? Through these things, Jesus gives you peace, a place, a promise, and a path. And it's all in Him. You don't have to be worried and stressed and discouraged and unhappy. You can have everything in Jesus Christ if you're saved. If you're not saved, you've got nothing. You should be worried if you don't have Jesus. You should be discouraged if you don't have Jesus. But if you've got Him, you can have His peace. He has a place for you. He has a promise He's coming again. And He is the path to heaven. I have Jesus. This morning, if you're not saved, I encourage you today to be honest with us and receive Christ into your heart so you can go to heaven when you die. If you are saved and you've received Christ, what are you worried about? What are you discouraged about? You know, I was all worried and nervous, and I didn't need to be. I had Jesus. I had all I needed. He has a place ready for me. It's ready for me, and it's ready for you. What a blessing. Let's stand for prayer. There is no promise. You never know at what point in time that you might enter into death. So you need to seize this opportunity and receive the Lord as your Savior. If there's anyone here, please raise your hand. If you want, you can talk to me later, maybe at the time of fellowship while we're eating. Just come up to me and let me know that you want to talk to me. I'll be more than willing to give you my attention and explain the gospel to you clearly and be sure that you have received the Lord as your Savior. If you have any questions, please let me know. You're more than welcome to come to my office and talk to me. Now, if the Lord touched your heart during this message and you need to repent of your sins, and change your life. Maybe you have gone astray from the Lord and you're kind of ashamed and embarrassed how to enter back into a right relationship with Him and ask the Lord to forgive your sins. You can come.
come to the altar and go down and pray about that. We've reached that time of service and the altar is open if you would like to come forward. 